Hi, my name is Megan Blake. I'm a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Sheffield. I'm also the director of an MA in food security and food justice. The research I'm going to talk to you about today is based on an ESRC Impact Acceleration Award um, pilot project that was aimed at understanding how local authorities might identify and support resilience in local communities to minimize the effects of food poverty and reduce rates of obesity. This table illustrates what I mean when referring to the different forms of resilience. Coping resilience provides a basis for people to survive but not necessarily thrive. Adapting resilience enables change in some degree of security, but it tends to rely on resources that are available within the communities and struggles to mobilize external resources to affect change. Transforming resilience mobilizes external resources and supports communities to thrive in the face of external shocks and threats. While research shows us what resilience look like and therefore how to evaluate it, there is limited guidance with regard to understanding where to look in the first instance. If you listen to narratives of food poverty in the UK, you might think this issue is a new thing. Certainly, when I talk to food charity providers, they point to a perceived absence of food banks in the UK prior to a few years ago pointing primarily to the transition from a Labour government to firstly the coalition and then more recently the Tory government. For example, Vernon in 2007 suggested that hunger in the UK was no longer a pressing problem for the second half of the 20th century in the UK because of the presence of a generous welfare state, low rates of unemployment and low food prices. However, one only need look a little bit to find work conducted in the mid-1990s and the early 2000s by people like Lang and Dowler and others that outlines the issue of food poverty, which is framed in terms of both hunger but also diet-related ill health outcomes as a result of an inability to access food that is safe, affordable, of good quality and culturally appropriate, and which provides for a sustained diet that is nutritious. So although this is not a new problem, there have been a number of changes recently that are enhancing the difficulties that low-income people face when trying to feed themselves and their families food that will sustain their health and well-being. Moreover, there have also been changes in the ways that local responses can be framed to address or prop up these needs. Broadly, the context of this growing insecurity includes a deepening of neoliberalism since 2009 that has brought with it a rollback of the state through a number of key mechanisms that include the reorganization of responsibilities and reductions in funding at the local level, changes to welfare, and a changing context of, third, of the third sector, which I'm defining as voluntary and quasi-voluntary organizations, community organizations, social enterprises, and cooperatives. Research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation in 2015 finds that in the UK there are approximately 11 million people living below the 75% of minimum income standard, which means that they are struggling to heat their homes, pay rent, or buy essentials. Of these, 1.25 million people are living in destitution. This is just a bit more than the population of Birmingham. In that same year, the UK was also ranked as the fifth richest country in the world. Reasons for use of emergency food include high housing energy costs, a poverty premium on food, transport, and energy, lack of living wage employment, benefits delays, and sanctions. Many who are struggling in this system are also finding themselves in debt and their response is to go without food and or household energy. Some of these people are in paid employment. Some have found themselves in need of support because of a sudden illness. While we can find people in need throughout the country, there are larger concentrations in formal industrial areas, largely in the north of England, in seaside towns, and in some London boroughs. The third sector is working to support people in need in their communities. While the landscape of community support is not entirely clear, because we do not collect data on these organizations, here is what we do know. What we have seen is a rapid increase in numbers of people needing to access emergency food support through community organizations and also a rise in the numbers of organizations who offer emergency support. Recent IFAN research has identified more than 2,000 such organizations, but they are not finished counting. There are also a host of organizations that offer other food-related services such as cafes, community food cupboards, cooking lessons, children's holiday programming, and so forth that are used by vulnerable people who may not be accessing or able to access emergency food supplies. 
Obesity has become a major talking point amongst the public in health policy and research. Obesity is identified as a major risk factor for a range of lethal diseases, including heart disease, non-insulin dependent diabetes, high blood pressure, and osteoarthritis. And, in the case of women, differs substantially by level of household income. While much of this discourse identifies the food choices of individuals to be the heart of the blame, there is also beginning to be recognition that the ways in which our food system is configured makes it much more difficult for those on low incomes to access food that is healthy, affordable, and nutritious. This project involved working with a local authority to try to identify resilience in highly deprived communities and then to help them pinpoint how they might facilitate that within a public health and well-being context. If resilience is resisting shock and to some extent performing in a manner that is better than expected, then we should be able to see evidence that it might be present using proxy data. In this case, it involved mapping actual rates of childhood overweight and obesity against the index of reparation predicted rates. IMD scores do to some extent predict rates of children's overweight and obesity. Given that the weight and poverty are correlated, we felt that a good place to start will be in a highly deprived community where rates of children's overweight and obesity are less than expected as perhaps an indicator that there is a food system within that community that is supporting its households to eat well. When we began this research, we did not know what to expect, nor did we identify community organizations as a potential source of this support. When the residuals are plotted, a number of communities emerged as having rates of children who were overweight and obese that were significantly lower than the predicted rates. In conversation with the local authority, we then chose one highly deprived community to be our case study. The work then involved going into the community and trying to learn what was happening. This involved shadowing and interviewing the team members working in the Healthy Families Unit and talking with head teachers in local schools. From this, we identified two community support organizations that were working in the area using food. In addition to interviewing, in some states, instances conducting repeated interviews with those running these organizations, a paid researcher also spent several weeks working in one of the charities supporting an emergency food pantry. I participated in cooking for a cafe that this organization ran, and we held two focus groups with residents where we mapped food options but also talked about what they did and how they managed their domestic food regimes, how they valued food and what their priority or priorities were when shopping for food. We also talked with them about the circumstances of their lives and how various changes in the welfare system have affected them or others in their community. We also regularly met with what turned out to be an ever-changing public health team in the local authority. A master student also gathered information from participants attending a number of different emergency food organizations representing different models of delivery in the local authority more widely. Toward the end of the project, I held a workshop that sought, that sought to broaden out the discussion somewhat in order to situate the findings of this work against what was going on elsewhere. About 50 people attended this workshop where we discussed strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats faced by third sector organizations and local authorities in their efforts to help communities thrive through food-related activity. Importantly, our way into this project was through public health, and we didn't sit easily in this. The project was interested in food poverty, but the remit of public health was obesity. This is a point I shall return to in the findings. Let me say now, however, this is a pilot research project. So we went to only one community. Further research could involve looking in other communities to see what is happening to support their lower rates. Likewise, communities that have significantly higher than predicted rates could also be investigated. So while this research cannot be generalized in a quantitative sense, in that the presence of community organizations can predict lower than expected rates of overweight or obesity, what the qualitative research tells us, though, is that the community organizations have a role in supporting household eating to meet food needs of households in low-income communities. The research also demonstrates how we might identify ways that the local authority might mobilize its resources, including ways that are not about giving money, to support these interventions. One of the things that emerged early in the research is that the local authority, the community organizations, and the people in the community talked about good food in really different ways. So while they're all using the same words or similar kinds of words, they're using them in quite distinct ways. 
This suggests that good food may be a boundary object. Boundary objects have particular affordances that enhance their ability to either separate people based on misunderstanding and miscommunication, or when navigated, they can be considered as an overlapping space where engagement across different social worlds can be made. To illustrate this, thinking about what our respondents told us and what is in the existing literature, we can think of good food as households think about it in the following way. It is having enough food to not be hungry. It's providing good food to one's family within a budget, which can demonstrate thrift. Eating good food is both a pleasure, but also a way to demonstrate status. People talked about healthy food relationally. In other words, in relation to other food options that they or their families could or did eat. For example, a hot meal is good food compared to a sandwich. And sometimes good food is food that doesn't put a burden on the environment. Within communities, good food is food that they can use to ensure people have enough. It is about making food available and about giving access when it does not exist. Good food can also be the food that enables community cohesion or that facilitates opportunities to learn, to participate, to develop. For those that we spoke to, increasingly, their understanding of good food really focused on these top four aspects, with the first being of primary importance, followed by thrift. Although the community organizations and the women we talked to were using the term good food to mean different things, there is enough shared overlap that gets translated through the activities that the organization supported to enable a shared space for resilience to happen. Community members valued and participated in the activities that are being provided. They were incorporating these programs and the food that they delivered into their household food practices. For these communities, good food was functioning as a boundary object to enable resilience, which I'll elaborate more in just a minute. To illustrate how good food can be a boundary object that separates, one need only look at the ways that there is a disconnect between how local authorities tend to view and mobilize the term compared to households. Some local authorities, including the one with whom I did this research, admit they struggle to communicate their messages effectively in ways that achieve the aims that they desire. Importantly, local authorities are also, to some degree, constrained by the larger institutional texts that shape their responsibilities and understanding of the term. There is more that can be said here, but I will instead focus on the key task at hand, which is to illustrate how, this third sec how third sector organizations can support the translation of this term to make it speak to households, and how local authorities can support these organizations to help communities become more resilient. While we have established that good food can act as a con connecting boundary object, I would like to point out that in this slide that not all good food activities enable transformation resilience, nor perhaps maybe ought they. In fact, within the community organization where we spent the bulk of our time, good food was providing a platform for coping resilience. It was clear that these services were needed in the pro and provided the community residents with a platform upon which to rest in the storm of uncertainty that is their lives. Over time, the organization has added additional programs that supported families who were struggling but who were managing to cope on their own and which offered these people and the community more widely adapting skills. Toward the end of this project, this community organization was able to build on previous projects to introduce a new surplus shop into the community. This came out of a free surplus food table that they offered to community members, which came out of a Facebook group. This has proven to be very popular. The new shop operates once a week and community members pay a flat membership fee to access the food. Not only does this support the longer term sustainability of the organization, but it meets self-identified community desires. There is no discount food store in this community, which meets thrift ideals and which they wanted. And this is a way to enable that. Just to note, these food-related activities sit amongst a whole host of other non-food-using activities to support the community, which when taken together help enable an important package of support. While they are doing activities that are enabling the community to adapt to external threats, they are not quite in a place where transformation can occur. However, this does not mean that good food activities are limited to adapting. There are things that the local authority is beginning to do to support a more transformational form of resilience. The community would like a market that will enable greater access to low-cost food and as a place that has lower barriers to entry for those wishing to develop employment opportunities.
The community also has a group of people who are keen gardeners and who use allotments, but there is a limited incentive for those who are not keen gardeners to become involved. One of the things that is being changed at regulation level is the allowance of surplus allotment food to be sold within community spaces. This has the potential to enable the community to become more self-sufficient and sustainable in terms of their food system, but in terms that matter to them. Food that is better that can, than that which can be purchased through a fast food outlet. Food that contributes even in a small way to household and community economies. Food that is not expensive, food that gives them pleasure. The continued rollout of welfare reform and the continued squeeze on local authorities means that we have to work together to pick up the pieces. Councils do have an important role to play, but it won't be in the form that it was in the past. It is clear that much of local authority language is that of government and not of communities and households, and that there are silos within local authorities that are limiting effectiveness. But it's also clear that there are those pushing to achieve better outcomes through collaboration, and we're beginning to see this on the landscape. So what lessons can we learn from this research? How might local authorities enter into the conversation? Well, first, identifying potential boundary objects, things, concepts, and organizations, and working to enable them to facilitate shared spaces to overcome social barriers and achieve disparate but aligned aims within and between the local authority, organizations, communities, and households, and so forth. They should also work across departments to address interlinked issues, for example, poverty and diet-related illness, by introducing social justice as a component of every policy decision and reduce institutional barriers to social justice where possible. They should also su support communities to extend extending existing activity from coping to adapting, from adapting to transforming, without losing track of the idea that coping, adapting, and transforming all are areas that need to be supported. They can do this by offering financial, human capital, network, data, tech, physical resources, and by creating policy changes.